So, welcome to this talk. It's unit testing with Qt application. My name is Harald Fjerninger. Yeah, I'm the current release manager of Qt and therefore very, very much interested that Qt has a high quality and Qt gets tested. <coughs> we write a lot of unit tests. And what you can see here is the usual punishment for developers that do not write tests. <laughs> Three hours in this position and you will write tests. <laughs> Okay, so I'm talking roughly an hour plus 15 minutes plus minus a few minutes Q&A. Afterwards, we will have half an hour break and then uh, it's the automatically testing Qt and Qtopia applications in this room from one of our partners. They will talk about uh, probably Squish and uh, more things. And then afterwards, at qu uh, quarter to six, we have strategies for embedded testing specifically for Qtopia customers. So this talk here is unit testing. We will get a little bit into graphical testing as well, GUI testing, but mostly unit testing. Also, I have a small addendum about memory checking. And then next talk in this room will be real hardcore GUI testing with event recording and so on, and afterwards embedded. <laughs> okay, we have one, two, three more chairs in the very front row, four. Uh, yeah, let's start. So contents of this talk, I already mentioned it, unit testing with QTestLib. So mostly I will talk about QTestLib, which is our own unit testing framework. And then at the end, I will have a few slides about memory debugging, which is usually quite useful in conjunction with unit tests. Okay, first chapter, unit testing with QTestLib. First, of course, the obligatory Wikipedia quote. What is a unit test? A unit test is a procedure used to validate that a particular module of source code is working properly. Quite obvious. The trick here is to test that a particular module of source code. So unit testing is you test one function and one unit only. You do not test like, okay, if I set a little bit here and a little bit there, how does this module, or if I have this condition, and so on. You don't test the whole of your application. You don't go to a logical flow to your application. You test one module and one module only. And make sure that this module does whatever it promises. For the unit testing, I have four subtopics. First, we will talk about basic testing, Hello World, and so on. How to use uh, Qt uh, Testlib. How to write your first unit tests. We'll go into data-driven testing. Show how to extend your tests, how to automate them more. Then we'll talk about GUI testing and useful little things, which actually is the largest chapter where I put everything I couldn't quite fit. So what is Qt Testlib? Qt Testlib is a unit test library that has been developed internally into Trolltech. When we started out, we had a lot of small main.cpp files which tested something and no one knew really what they tested and no one ever executed them when we released a new version. Then at some point we decided, hey, we can make it a bit more comfortable. We introduced some macros, we, we uh, wrote a test lib, we added some unit testing, we rewrote the entire thing, we rewrote the entire thing again. So what you see here now is, I don't know, a, <laughs> a rewrite of a rewrite of a rewrite. And this is the unit testing library which we like inside of Trolltech, which we use very, very extensively within Trolltech to test our code to make sure that what we deliver to you is top-notch quality and that we won't introduce new regressions. Regressions is uh, um, behavioral change or a bug that hasn't been there in the version before. Some of the design goals of our QTest library is it is lightweight. So it's not a huge, huge, huge framework which we have to port to 10 different architectures and so on, which takes a lot of energy. It is quite lightweight. It won't try to interfere too much with, uh, with you because we, we had some test libraries, some iterations with the test libraries, which did so much stuff that the actual uh, thing that you tested already had so many side effects from the test library because it took some screenshots and it measured your screen metrics and it did all the stuff. So you were already in a state which wasn't natural. So our test library is hopefully quite lightweight. It is cross-platform, cross-compiler, of course, since we test Qt with it. It has to be. And the good thing is that tests are written in C++. 
we started out saying, okay, let's write it in Python, and then half of the developers said, no, Python sucks, I want Ruby. And then we added Ruby support, and came the Perl crowd in. So <laughs> tests are written in C++. Um, good thing is you can use your IDE, whatever environment you are to write cute code, you can write your tests as well. And the other good thing, which we learned by pain, is tests are standalone executable. If you have to set up an environment and to run anything to actually execute your test, that is another threshold. Well, we see it. our developers didn't do it. They were too lazy. Oh, I have to recompile something. I have to install something. So tests are just standalone executables. You run them. You run them in your debugger. You copy them around. You execute them wherever you are, and they will just run. They are just queued applications. So let's start with the Hello World. Where's my, uh, so I have a class which I call your string test. It's a public queue object, so no magic here. Don't forget the queue object macro. If you're using Qt, you already know you have to put it in there. We have one private slot here. So in other words, all the test functions are private slots. I have one private slot called void to upper, and usually we have a convention. The name doesn't matter, but usually the name of the test slot corresponds to whatever API function in the class it is testing. So here we test the queue string to upper function. I create a queue string and initialize it with text. And then we have this magic macro queue compare, which compares two values. I say compare that the string dot to upper, the result of this operation, actually is a queue string uppercase T, uppercase E, uppercase X, uppercase T. This guy wouldn't work. Q uh, compare macro would output a failure and the test would fail. Otherwise, it will work. So all you need to do is to just add a few more private slots and that's it. The, the trick here is you wanted to keep it as easy as possible. This thing is a pattern that everyone who uses Qt is familiar with. Q object, Q object macro, run the mock over it, and you don't have to register your test function. You make a private slot, you don't have to say, these are my test functions. And then you implement a test function, you forget to register it, it will never be executed, and so on. We just use the meta object system. Then we have to do a, a tiny little bit of boring work. Of course, we have to include the Qt test header to get the macros and to get the functionality. And at the bottom of the test, we write Qt test underscore main and give it the name of a class. Our class was Q string test, so I just write Q string test here. That's it. I compile the guy, I get a standalone executable. Yeah, yes. <laughs> I compile the guy, meaning uh, I run QMake, minus project, to generate a project file. I just create a tst.cpp. Say con config plus equals Q test lib. Um, if you're not using QMake as a build system, just make sure you link to, my, uh, to a Q test lib. That's all you need to do. So as little intrusive as possible, create a project in Visual Studio, whatever, make sure you link to QTestLib, that's it. Build it, in our case, QMake and Make, or NMake, or MinGW, Make, or whatever you use, and you run it. QString test. So how does it look like? I run it. Let's run it again. I see it takes a few seconds to run. This is the internal queue string test. I have 84 tests passed, zero failed, and 11 were skipped because some um, locale are not installed on this machine, so we couldn't test the queue string locales function here. You see this is green. We have green passes, which is a very good thing because sometimes you have a lot of test output. So if you want to see where is my actual failure, you get a red failure, and you instantly see where this guy failed and can start fixing it. So yeah, same example. I run something. I have this magic in a test case, which is a slot which will be executed before the test case is started if it exists. All my uh, private slots will be executed, and luckily they pass. And then we clean up the test case and finished. The good thing is, uh, of course, you could argue I can use the constructor of my class to initialize my test. But what happens if during the initialization something fails? 
so instead of a constructor, you use the init test case and the cleanup test case. If you have a, very, a compare in there or a test failure, the whole test will not run and you will be notified in the test output result there was something wrong. So as you've seen, the output just goes to standard out. You can redirect it, of course, if you want, but it goes to standard out on your console. You don't need any special runners, any application where you need to execute them. It outputs plain text or XML, so you can also switch, uh, change the XML output to feed it into some uh, software that will uh, count the test failures or generate some reports. What we do internally, we just run them with XML nightly, have some style sheets to uh, make it a bit nicer and uh, put it on a web page. Supports colored output, you've seen the fails are green, uh, the, the passes are green, the fails will be red. Another nice thing is that the messages are atomic and thread safe. Meaning that if you have a warning or a failure or something uh, and you run it for multiple threads, it won't happen that suddenly one fail will be interweaved with another fail and something, something. so um, it's fairly safe for uh, multi-threaded testing. And they have IDE-friendly line numbers. If a test fails, you can double-click if you run it from uh, within Visual Studio, double-click on the failure, and it will go into the position of your C++ code where it failed. Same on Unix with kdevelop. Unfortunately, not Xcode at the moment. Okay. We already have the QCompare macro. We have another one called QVerify. And verify just verifies that the condition actually evaluates the true. That's like an assert. So in here we say verify i plus j equals to 6. If this evaluation would uh, be false, bam, test failure, test function will stop executing and we'll jump to the next test function. QCompare is a bit smarter. It takes two arguments. So here we do a QCompare i plus j comma 6. So it actually uses the comparison operator to compare the two guys. And the advantage here is if the verify fails, it will just say something larger equals something something. The expression return false. If a compare fa fails, you actually see, okay, we, we were asking for the string to end and we got a zero and we expected a hard-coded four, which of course evaluates the four. So you see the two uh, values which we actually compared and you can pretty much guess what, uh, what's going wrong. Okay, so much for the basic testing. So tests are basically just key object subclasses, easy to write, easy to build, no runners, no hassle. Tests are C++ application. Uh, you don't need any special runners. You can relocate them. You can copy them from machine to machine, test it on another machine, and do everything you can do with a normal binary as well. Okay, so much for the basic testing. Let's look at data-driven testing. Let's, uh, you remember we had our QString test, we tested two upper function, and now of course instead of text here, um, we want to uh, check, okay, what if I have a mixed case string? What will two upper do? Will it still return an uppercase string? What if I feed it a text that is already uppercased? Will the two upper do the right thing and return the same string again? So if you do that, you will copy-paste, 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 boring. That's why we introduced the underscore data functions. So you, you just, uh, our string, uh, sorry, our test was called two upper, and now we create a two upper underscore data, which will be magically picked up by the uh, test framework. And what we do here is we create a test table. We create two columns and three rows which will look like this. We have the data name, two columns, and three rows. And here we feed it values like val, val or falafel, or up, or, and so on, whatever. And um, these are just test names, so later on if the test fails, we can identify, aha, the mixed case failed, or ooh, the uppercase failed. So these are just labels, basically. What happens is um, that before the actual test is executed, the underscore data function is executed, and you will have this table here in memory. And now we rewrite our test. 
First, we say qfetch. We fetch the first string, which is called input. We fetch a second string, which is called result. And then we compare that the input dot two upper is actually the result. So this string will, uh, this test will run three times now. First, our uh, string called input will be lowercase val. Then, uh, and the result will of course be uppercase val. Then it will be cute, cute, up, up. So we run three times through it and every time do the compare here. So if a row fails, we actually see, okay, our queue string test to upper, and this is the tag name, so the mixed case failed. Actually, we got Q and a lowercase t, and we expected a uppercase Q and an uppercase t, and the location is main CPP line 18. So if you have that, if you run it in KDevelop or in Visual Studio, you click on this line and you will be brought to the position where it fails. You know it's the mixed test data and you can start fixing the code or the test. <laughs> well, yes, of course. I mean, the test could be wrong too. So a summary of the data-driven testing part. We have a strict separation, or strict, we have a separation of logic and data. So you have the logic, whatever you do in your test, and uh, the data in a separate function, nicely split, so you can see what am I actually testing. It improves readability because uh, you can read the logic, and if you add more cases to it, it won't like bloat. It's easily extendable, like for example, our support people, when they get a support request from you with these two values do not match, they just go in the data function, add the data, check it, see, oh, it works, or, oh, it doesn't work. It eases the testing of border cases because usually you test something very nicely and then someone comes and says, now test it with an empty queue string. <sighs> now test it with a null queue string. Now test it with an invalid value. Test it with a negative int and so on. And it, of course, I mentioned it reduces the copy-paste in, in your tests. Okay, we have the basic testing, the data-driven testing. Now let's look at some GUI testing, graphical user interface testing. We have, um, since we are a unit testing framework, we, we have, um, of course, we have keyboard and mouse simulation, but we actually send native queued events. So we don't send actual, uh, we don't tell the windowing system like the X server to move the mouse pointer and to actually simulate a click because that's usually quite error prone. And what happens if there's another window on top of your window, then the click would go into the wrong thing. Um, the first iteration of our unit test library had actually that. And what happened was that I switched on my machine in the morning and I saw that the, the test was of course totally wrong and at some point it actually managed to open the control center and reconfigure something <laughs> because the test just ran randomly on the desktop. And so, <laughs> so now we just send queued events which is probably okay for you because you trust that we test queued, right? So the event translation from X and from Windows will always result in the right thing. And you just bombard your widgets or whatever you want to test with queued events. We support the usual stuff, clicking, double clicking, pressing, releasing of keys and mouse movement. So a little bit for the, for the API. We have key click, key press, key release, and as arguments, you have to pass in a widget, of course, which should receive those events. And for, yeah, the keyboard entry uh, simulation, of course, asks you for a single character, so you can pass in an A or a B, or a cute column, column key, like for example, key escape, or a key, what other dead key we have, key F9. An optional keyboard modifier, shift key, control key, alt key, meta key, apple key, whatever. An optional display, ah, that is wrong, an optional coordinate, sorry. <laughs> this is an optional coordinate because by default, an optional display? Oh, sorry, typo for my case. I should say an optional delay, optional delay. So, uh, um, because sometimes widgets might be not quite forgiving as so you really hammer them with a lot of events. So you can say leave 10 or 20 milliseconds before you start bombing it with more uh, events. And for convenience, we have a function called key clicks, which takes a list of characters of cute keys. So you can 
say key clicks hello world and then it will send an event H E L L O space and so on. Simple, ex simple example. We have some test called test GUI. We create a line edit. We say Q test key clicks on that line edit. And the text is here. And then we compare the line edit the text that it actually contains the string which we just sent to it with key clicks. I can show a more exciting test. <sighs> so our Q line edit test pops up a line edit. Uh, that was a bit fast. So I say minus key delay then. And you see, we populate it with a lot of stuff. We backspace it, we feed it with something, we select, we release it, we set masks on it and uh, torture it. Uppercase, we check that selection works. If you select everything, then press backspace that the result is empty. You check that the uh, right signals are done, check that the Unicode works and so on. Check that if it's centered, that it still works okay. And bam, luckily it passed 59 pass, zero failed, zero skip. Cute works. Mouse simulation, similar. We have mouse click, mouse double click, mouse press, mouse release. The arguments, again, we take a widget on which this, uh, to which this event will be sent. A mouse button, left key, right key, middle key, or fancy key on the side and so on. Optional modifier, shift, control, alt. A position, and by default, this will be the center of the widget. For example, if you click a push button, you don't care whether it's a position one, one, or in the lower right, you just want to see that the click works, so the default is the center. And this time, I don't have a typo, it takes an optional delay. Here is important because you have to distinguish between a single click and a double click. So if you send a left click and another left click directly after each other, it will be interpreted as double click. <coughs> and we have a convenience function mouse move, which just moves the mouse pointer and sends the mouse move events. Another example, we create a push button and we say Q test mouse click on the button with the left mouse button. And of course, after this, you would write a lot of compares and verify to make sure that your widget is in the state you actually want it to be. A pretty nice functionality we have in there is the QTest event list. It is a QTest event list is just a list of GUI events. So here we I actually put it in the data function of my test. Uh, I create a new column called test event list, and I can populate it with a lot of test event lists. Um, so what I'm doing, I instance a QTest event list. I add a key click with a key A. I add 100 milliseconds delay, and then I add another key click with Q colon colon key backspace. So what happens is if I replay this QTest event list on any widget, it would send an A, wait, and delete it again and I call it there and back and pop it in. In my actual test, I fetch my event list, I create a line edit, and I call li uh, my list dot simulate on the line edit. So it will just replay those events. Of course, you can add mouse moves, mouse clicks, delays, key clicks, key, um, and all, this, um, all the other stuff. So then here I would check that my line edit is in my desired state, add a lot of verifies, compares, and then I can do the same, or I take the same list and now I simulate it on a combo box and make sure that the combo box behaves correctly. So, small summary of the GUI part. We have non-native mouse and keyboard simulation for queued widgets. Of course, if you have some MFC widgets, they won't quite get it if you send queued events to them. <laughs> well, you couldn't even compile it. Uh, we have very basic support for replaying events. So you can can some events, you can store them and then replay them again. But of course, this is quite tedious because it's still C++. So you have to, if you have a more complex dialog, you have to find your widget, you have to do a lot of stuff. So if you want to do serious uh, GUI testing, I would say use a third-party tool like Squish or KD Executor. 
and um, actually both of them, both uh, our partners are here, they exhibit on this side. And there it allows you to actually record events, so you can move the mouse, you can click on that stuff, you can enter text, it will record whatever you entered, and then you can replay it again. And as I said, they will have a presentation about that later. Okay, so much for the GUI testing. Let's talk about all the useful little things in there. So this is a test library written for Qt. We have some cute specific ones there and also some short text specific ones. One little feature is the expect fails. We have a macro called qExpectFail that marks the next verify or compare as expected failure. The next and only the next. And optionally, if you have test data, you can say, okay, I expect the failure only for the mixed test data or only for the all upper test data. Or you can say for all test data, it will always fail. It can either stop or continue the uh, test execution. So for example, if you uh, expect a failure um, in, the very, in the very next execution, which will lead your widget or whatever in an inconsistent state, it doesn't, it doesn't really make sense to test the rest of it because it's just broken. So you say stop continuing the test after the next uh, test, after the next compare expectedly fails. Another thing is, and this is really, really indirect, if you expect a failure, but you actually get a pass, what is that? That is an X pass, an unexpected pass. So actually the test lib should be happy. Yay, it, 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 it survived and we expected a fail, but now it complains X pass. You have something in there which you expect a failure, but it passes. Let's look at an example. We have a Q expect fail for the data called data 12. And we see C task number X in our internal task tracking system or so. This is the message that will be appended to the test log. And we say continue executing of the test. Then we compare that my string to int is my expected result and we expect this one fails. Okay, uh, and it correctly failed, we continue this verify here is completely uh, independent. So it doesn't matter that we expect it uh, fail this guy here because the expect fail is only for the next one. Okay, so this one is not uh, affected. And then we expect fail for every test data, say totally broken in the test result and abort. And here I have a verify my object initialized. My object cannot be initialized. No point continue testing, I abort. But still the uh, test log won't record a failure but an expected failure. Skipping, um, the expected failure will actually record something in the test log. So in our internal evaluation, it, sh it still shows up. It's not quite as critical as a failure, but it's still an expected failure, which you should fix in the future. So it will show up. Skip is another way to stop executing your test. For example, if you can't connect to your database, you say QSkip cannot test without DB, and you say, skip all entries in my test data. So no matter what uh, test data you have, you will skip them all. Because if you have a database test and no connection, you'll just skip it. And uh, a skip will be recorded in the test uh, result. So no big deal. QVerify2 is a verbose QVerify. You remember QVerify, just uh, check the first statement here for true or false. But often you actually want to output more information. So here I have a QSQL query and I say, uh, execute show tables in my database. And if that one fails, I have a second parameter and I just output the last error's text, qprintable, um, because I have to pass in a car star. <coughs> so what I get is, this thing will never be executed if the show tables actually works. If the show table fails, this code path will be executed and I will have the databases information about what happened in my test log. We have a concept or we have a functionality to ignore messages, which is Q test con con ignore message. For example, I have a Q URL and a set uh, port minus 4242. Of course, uh, minus 4242 is an invalid port, so uh, the uh, URL will com uh, complain, QURL set port out of range. And now we actually want to test that QURL complaints because we want 
if someone does it like this, we want to have an error which you can see. So we say Qtest colon colon ignore message. It is a warning message. Could also be a debug message or fatal message. We pass in the string we expect. And if at the end of the test we will not receive this warning message, the test will fail. So this is to, to basically check that the warnings and, and debugs, uh, well, not debug statements because we don't leave them in, but the warning statements occur at the right position. Ha, now comes my favorite class. Not only because I wrote it, it's very useful. Q signal spy. You know we have signals and slots in Qt. And to debug them, it was always quite tedious because if you test something, you have to create this little object, you have to connect to that, you have to count how often this uh, was um, executed, you have to store the arguments, and so on. Oh, boring. So one day, I sat down and totally abused the meta object system, and the result was the QSignalSpy. QSignalSpy will fake any signal, or uh, will fake a slot at runtime. So you don't have to implement a slot. Um, you, it can fake anything. It can fake a slot called foo, which takes three Q-string arguments. And it can handle any kind of parameter. So string, of course, integers, but also your custom structs and whatever your signal is emitting, as long as it's registered with Q-meta type. You have the Q-register meta type macro, so you can put in whatever. Internally, it is implemented as a list of list of variant. So it's a two-dimensional array, meaning that the first list uh, contains all the signal invocations. Let's see, you invoke that signal three times. You will have three entries in your first list. And the inner lists contain the parameters. So you emit three signals, which have a Q-string argument each. You will have a list with containing three lists with one, uh, with one Q-string each. An example, we have a line edit. We create a signal spy, give it a pointer to that line edit. So this must be a pointer to any Q-object subclass and say signal text changed with a Q-string argument. So in the back, it will fake a slot called slot text changed, which takes a string, automatically connect to it. We set text to hello. And now we check that our spy.count is one because we want one signal and only one signal. It would be a bug if you set the text and suddenly you would get 100 signals. And we check that the spy.value is zero, value is zero. So uh, the first uh, emission of this signal, its first argument to string is actually the string hello, which is set here. So that makes it really, really easy. You have one line of code to fake a slot, to connect to it, and then you can always check how often has the signal be emitted and what were the arguments. And yes, the code is ugly. Inside of signal spy, but it's nice and contained, so you don't have to worry. Ha, event loop. Sometimes we had some tests which tried to connect to some server, and some guy switched off the server, and it would just sit and sit and sit forever. And three days later, someone would find out, oh, this is test run, which is still hanging on that machine, using up resources. So we have a Qt test event loop, which you can use to wait for events. And usually when you test networking, it has a timeout, so the tests won't run forever. And the good thing is it spins a new event loop, so you won't have busy waiting. You won't have while true check connected, check connected, check connected, because then your CPU will sit there with 100% and won't be nice. And the other thing is that the main event loop won't process events. So you, um, if you have other events in the queue, those won't be processed. It will wait till our queue test event loop stops, and then your normal execution will start again. Let's have an example. We have a queue socket. We um, yeah, queue test event loop is a singleton. So here we get an instant instance. The instance is singleton instance of a queue test event loop. I connect my slot, uh, socket's connected signal to my loop's exit loop. So whenever exit loop is called, or whenever my signal connects, it will call exit loop, which will exit the loop, of course. Then I tell my socket to connect to imap.x.no at port 143, which is the imap port. What will happen is that this is asynchronous. So in the back, it will try to connect. 
And here I say enter loop with 30 seconds maximum. So in here I will spin my little local event loop. It will spin, it will spin, it will spin, it will spin. At some point imap.x.no uh, is connected. The socket will emit the connected signal and the exit loop will call. So here we continue execution. And here we check loop.timeout. The stupid name, it should be was timeout or is timeout or something. Anyway, uh, we can check whether the loop has timeout. Because if 30 seconds pass, then of course the loop would run into a timeout, so our test would fail. If um, the socket is connected to imac.troll.no, before 30 seconds pass, this will be false, so our test will continue executing. And we can start using imap.x.no. Sleeping and waiting. And we have two convenience functions called QSleep and QWait. QSleep blocks the test for a certain amount of milliseconds, and there won't be any event processing, and the test will be unresponsive. So it will just stop. It will use internally microsleep or, or the capital sleep on Windows, so everything is blocked. Then we have a slightly smarter version of that, which is called QWait. It waits for a certain amount of milliseconds, but it actually spins the main event loop, so the test stays responsive for GUI and network interaction. So if you have some modal dialog or, or something, and you wait for something to happen, then actually GUI events will be delivered, your GUI will stay responsive during the test, and you can do all sorts of stuff. Let's look at some command line arguments. Interesting when I actually show it. Let's go to the line edit again. I already showed the showed the key delay 10, which will add um, a certain delay in milliseconds between the uh, between the key events, so that we can actually see what happens. Oops, key line edit. I have uh, another one called minus v2 for verbose level two which will actually dump each and every compare and verify that we have. So here you see this passed, and now we have, we enter the car with auto control modifier. We have a compare in line two, uh, 2969, another compare, another compare. This thing was entered because the Unix machines usually either have very bad debuggers or they're simply too slow to debug. So if you have this verbose mode, you can actually almost see line by line what's happening. Everything will be dumped out, and if it crashes or if something fails, you see where exactly it fails. Of course, there's a minus help. <coughs> Excuse me. I can show the XML output if I run the same thing in XML. I'll get this. Of course, you can run it with minus si oh, silent. Then you only see the expected failure and the warnings, but not the passes. So you have a considerably less output, nicer to read. Another really nice feature is the verbose with signals. So that what I'm doing here is, this is another heavy abuse of a meta object system. I dump each and every signal and each and every slot in, uh, that was invoked because of that signal. So you can see here, at some point, uh, uh, we emitted the signal uh, on the line edit called test widget. We emitted text edited. With, uh, and the argument is a Q-string, and the contents of the string are one, two, three. And this signal was connected to this slot, TSTQ line edit on text changed with a Q-string. If this slot would emit another signal, you would get another level of indentation. You would see the signal slot, slot, signal slot. So everything that happens in the signal slot mechanism will be dumped out, which is quite nice for debugging. If you want to see, hey, what happened to my signal? What was actually called after I emitted my signal? What is my program flow? because it produces a lot, a lot of information. Yeah, once we had a situation where a developer forgot to remove a queue debug statement in the event function, which will be called a million times per run, which led that uh, the tests were actually recording those debug outputs. So for everything, it would uh, 
uh, store it, and you'll be quite surprised how fast you can fill up a 200 gigabyte hard drive with that information. So that's where, I added the, the, that's where we added the minus max warnings here, so you can limit the amount of messages that will be output to the warnings and debugs, and by default it's 2,000. If you want more, you can of course just set max warnings to zero. That means unlimited, and it will output whatever. We have some time, so I can show you the QWidget auto test, for example. This is the most annoying auto test. Why? Because it pops up a lot of widgets. It pops up full screen, minimizes it full screen, minimizes it. So basically, when you run this guy, your computer will stay unresponsive. So I can show you a little tool called Xephyr. Um, There was a fail? No, nah, impossible. <laughs> pass, pass, fail. <laughs> I didn't see it. <laughs> yeah, it could happen. Maybe it's because I'm running this thing in a VMware with a strange, or maybe Qt is broken, I don't know. Or the test is broken. I'll debug it after the talk. What I want to show you is a little tool called Xephyr. Um, for those of you who know Xnest and who hate Xnest, Xephyr is the tool to use. It's like Xnest, but it actually works. So I'll run Xephyr and say colon one, the display ID, da da da, and I get an X server within my X server. So just like XNest, and you see it's the wonderful X gray background. Of course, I can start. I don't have a tiny window manager. No, no window manager here. Well, it doesn't matter. Let's start the test directly. Test the widget. So you see, nothing happens on my main display. This thing runs in the embedded X because I. Uh, Told him to use the I told the test to use the display colon one instead of my main uh, display, and now it doesn't matter. This thing can pop up as many annoying messages as I want. I can leave it in the background. It still fails, <laughs> and things happen. I'm not the maintainer of QWidget, so I'm not responsible. <laughs> <laughs> and once we're done with it, we close it, and it's gone. Okay, so again, verbose output, dumb all signal slots, have a key delay, have a mouse delay, so you can see what happens. You can and debug your test. <coughs> okay, summary of this section. We try to make it easy to write tests for Qt based code. We have the signal introspection, we have the Qt test event loop. I hope you succeeded. It is very lightweight, 6,000 lines of code, only exports 60 symbols, so it's quite easy to learn, I would say, and easy to maintain, which is a good thing for us, um, since we have to conquer a lot of platforms, and, um, and also when Q changes, it's easier to change the Q test lib, and also you can extend it and add your own modules to it. The tests are written in C++, you get standard executables, no environment tasks, which you don't have to learn a new IDE, you don't have to learn a new program where suddenly control A is and select all but something. Or for those of you who use Emacs, you usually, or VI, we usually don't like to be put into an IDE with suddenly different key bindings. No, use your environment, write your tests. QTestLib is quite self-contained. Of course, it has a dependency on libqt core, but that's it. So no external stuff in there. Cross-platform, cross-compiler, it runs everywhere Qt does. And I convinced all developers to use it, even without that guy. Okay, we'll have some time for questions later. I, next to the Qt test lib, I also want to talk about memory debugging because this is something so essential which we do almost as natural as writing unit tests inside of Trolltech. And we have two tools which we mainly use internally. You might know them. 
Valgrind on, excuse me, on Valgrind.org. It is open source, available for Linux and FreeBSD. There's a half-witted Mac port, but it doesn't really work well. It supports Intel i386, AMD64, and of course the newer Intel CPUs and the PowerPC. It's, yeah, probably the most used memory debugger inside of Joltek. Then for completion, I also have the MUD flap in here. Not that often used, but it works, uh, it works on all the platforms where Valgrind doesn't run. It is part of GCC, so actually if you install the GCC compiler, you get MUD flap as well. And it needs an operating system with symbol redirection, which are most Unixes except Mac OS X. They are playing around together to work on Mac OS X, but currently it only works on uh, most of the Unixes out there. Yeah, there are, of course, more memory debuggers which we use, especially on Windows, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not that a Windows expert, so uh, I can't tell you that. I know that internally we use Purify, and uh, for the Windows developers who make sure that the thing works, but since Qt, most of the Qt code is platform independent, we basically find 98% of all the memory corruptions and things with Valgrind and MATLAB, and then usually the Windows developer go over it and test the 2% of the Windows code, run all the auto tests in Purify, and chase after the warnings that Purify outputs. So you might know the problem. You have a get text, which returns a car star, <coughs> which is mallocked inside of this function. We sprint f something into this uh, character and return it. And then we write a nice documentation and say, okay, get text will actually allocate the text and the caller is responsible to delete it. Honestly, who of you would have read the documentation? No one. So we have a memory leak. So let's look at it. Yeah. I prepared this, so I have a main.cpp which does the same uh, which contains the same get text, and I call it in my main function exactly once. I run gcc minus g since I want debug information, main.cpp. I build it, done. I run it a.out, dot and it works. It doesn't crash, it doesn't do anything, except that it leaks memory. And the operating system won't tell me, because the operating system and the application exit will just free the entire memory. It's gone. And of course, if you call that, it's... Um, Often enough, it will uh, be killed by the kernel after a while. So I run Valgrind. Yeah. Out. And you see it's a bit slower than usual. And I run Valgrind, minus minus leak, check equals yes, run a dot out. And it runs it. And you can see 100 bytes in one block in one block are definitely lost in record one of one. So inside of malloc, in my get text, main.cpp line six, in my main function, uh, called from a main function at 14. So I see this was called one, we have one block, so it's 100 bytes, and I see, ha, memory leak. I can go in, I can fix the problem. Now with mudflap, you actually have to instrumentalize your code. So um, to, to build this, I just ran gcc minus g main.cpp. If I want to use mudflap, I have to instrumentalize. I have to say minus f mudflap. And I have to link to the mudflap library. And I have to use g plus plus. Funny. Okay. Again, I got a file called a.out. And I run a.out. And nothing happens. Why? Because I forgot to set the environment. Okay, what you have to do is you have to set your mudflap options to something, otherwise mudflap will just do nothing. So I do this now. Mudflap.env, so I send, set my mudflap option to print leaks, and I run my little example again. And da 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 da! Leaked object one. The object with this pointer. Uh, at this region in the memory were of size 100 on the heap, of course, because I malloced it, was lost. And for some reason, I don't get the proper backtrace. I only get the 
symbol names. So inside of underscore zap get text v, which is of course my get text. Um, at this position, it leaked. So you can at least you get a backtrace, not very readable, but you get one, and you can check where my leak happened. So I already mentioned it. If you want to use MATLAB, you instrumentalize your code, build with minus f MATLAB, link with minus l MATLAB, and run it with MATLAB options set to something. You can set your MATLAB options to minus help, and it will actually show you what options are possible. So we already looked at this. This would be the MATLAB output. This would be the valgant output. My little get text. So let's look at the out of bounds read and writes. You might know this problem too. We have a car star and we malloc 10 characters. Then we sprint f exactly 10 characters in our v. And what happens? Here's a small backslash zero, the zero terminator. So actually we copy 11 character and we have an out of bounds read on the heap. Okay, I run it in background. Uh, oh, that was too much. And bam, I get an invalid write of size one because I copied 11 characters in a buffer of 10. I got my backtrace again and get text, which is called from main. And not only do I get the backtrace of where this invalid write happened, but I also get the backtrace of where this buffer was allocated. So I see in main.cpp the buffer was allocated. In main.cpp.7, I've wrote over the boundaries. Quite useful. MATLAB, of course, could do the same, but I'm not going to show this now. So the volume output again, we have, um, yeah. Another typical problem is the uninitialized memory. A problem, you have a function, you have an int i, and you don't initialize it, and then you call if i is 42, I do something. And I run Valgrind, I'm going to it out, and surprise, surprise. Conditional jump or move depends on uninitialized value. I called from main line 30 and main.cpp7, I have this unconditional jump. So in other words, Valgrind finds it and wants you correctly. I mean, this is valid C++ code, right? So the compiler will never ever complain, or it might complain if it's smart enough, but usually they don't. Okay, so summary, both Valgrind and MATLAB are open source and very, very usable. Valgrind is really, really heavily used inside of Choltec, and if you find a memory corruption, it's not cute. Now, of course, if you run a typical Qt application in Valgrind, you will probably get 20 or so warnings of uninitialized memory, which are bogus. Uh, the most common one is we um, create uh, X events and we send them via socket. So we have an X event, and which is of size 30, and we just write 20 characters in it and then a stock byte. Still, uh, the entire 30 uh, bytes is transmitted over socket. But of course, on the other side, it will never be evaluated. So yes, we do touch uninitialized memory, but it doesn't really matter. And those warnings you will usually find in Valgrind, that uh, use of uninitialized memory. And also there are some static memory leaks within font config and within uh, other parts of our dependency library, so you will see those. But they do not come from Qt, okay? And MATLAB, yeah, um, we usually use Valgrind and MATLAB on the more obscure Unix systems where Valgrind is not ported to. So much for unit testing and memory testing. And oh yeah, internally in Qt we have three, four, five, no, it's more, 7,000 unit tests and we nightly run them through Valgrind and make sure that these unit tests A, perform and B, do not leak or do not have memory corruptions or do not do something which you wouldn't like to happen on your customer's machine. We have 15 more minutes for questions. Okay. Uh